Uh, David has assisted the History Channel, Learning Channel, Discovery Science, and uh, Smithsonian Channels on UFO documentaries. And uh, he has uh, one of the world's largest libraries at his home, right here in Rio Rancho. Uh, probably the world's largest collection of UFO files and the books and the videos and photographs. And he has the original photograph of the Los Angeles air raid of 1942, the Battle of Los Angeles. He has the original photo taken by a UPI photographer. And uh, so it, it's, it's amazing. But uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, David Mahler, author of Triangular UFOs, a fascinating subject. So David Mahler. For those of you that may have caught Channel 13 News, I was talking about triangular UFOs. It's an area that I've been researching now for uh, at least 10 years actively. Uh, my interest is in the overall history and research of the UFO subject, but specifically triangular UFOs. And I'll give you a little bit of my background and I think it'll explain why my interest is what it is. So uh, the title is Triangular UFOs, an estimate of the situation. And that's what we're gonna try to do is estimate the situation that we're dealing with specific to these triangular UFOs. Well, all of us come with different perspectives, different thresholds of belief or acceptance. And the one thing I always like to mention is UFOs, fact, fiction, folklore, Whatever you relegate it to, it's part of our history, part of our culture. Uh, you know, even people that don't, I hate to use the term, believe in UFOs will acknowledge that it's part of our uh, sociology, it's part of our culture. So that's how I like to look at it. Uh, we've been dealing with this mystery now actively since 1947. So we're looking at about 65 plus years of active research, uh, both on the part of the military, the United States and otherwise and civilian organizations. So we have amassed a lot of files. As Norio was very gracious, he said I have a lot, one of the, the largest collection, I have one of the largest collections of case files and material. But there's a wealth of data there, and we do a fair good, fairly good job, both in MUFON and other organizations, of investigating reports. But it does no good to simply take that report, file it away, and then move on to the next case. We need to look at the body of data that we've collected over decades and see if there's any patterns that exist in the data. If there are, it's suggested that we're dealing with a genuine phenomenon. Well, I think I found some patterns with regard to the triangular UFO phenomenon. This is just some of the collection that I have on file. I've had several researchers. Uh, Greg was over yesterday. Norio's been over. Uh, also had Michael Schrapp make a couple of treks uh, from Arizona to come and go through some of the files. That's just a sampling of uh, a little bit of what I have in the way of information. But the development of the UFO phenomenon, when we think about it, really goes back to, at least in the modern age, June 24th, 1947. Uh, nine saucer or crescent-shaped objects were sighted over Mount Rainier by Kenneth Arnold, who was a private pilot. And he was actually misquoted by a United Press reporter when asked, how did these objects fly? And he stated, well, it was as if you took a saucer and skipped it across the water. And uh, with many journalists, they tend to misquote you, and uh, they said that uh, Arnold saw a flying saucer. So uh, this is kind of the iconic imagery, you know, the saucer or circular-shaped objects that we've had for decades now. And some people might kind of consider me an iconoclast in the sense that I'm kind of smashing that traditional image because we're going to be talking about a shift or a change that we've seen in the UFO literature uh, roughly since 1989 as far as the general public was concerned. Um, in 1989, as was referenced earlier by Michael Schratt, uh, specifically November 29th, 1989, a gigantic wave or flap of UFO sightings occurred involving large triangular objects moving at low altitude over the Belgian countryside. The vast majority of these eyewitnesses consisted of the Belgian, Belgian gendarmerie, which was the uh, police at the time, and uh, many eyewitness accounts occurred, uh, multiple eyewitness accounts, more importantly, the Belgian military also acknowledged that they were dealing with a genuine phenomenon, which was unheard of in military circles. Uh, it's very strange. You would never hear the United States military making a statement that we're dealing with a genuine phenomenon and we can't control it. But that's essentially what the Belgian military was stating. So that was my introduction into the triangular UFO mystery. Actually, a mutual UFO network or MUFON article in which they uh, covered the case. It was actually extensively written up by uh, reporter Bob Pratt. And uh, this is just one sketch of one of the objects that was seen over Brussels, as you can see there, December 1st, 1989. 
So uh, numerous reports throughout Brussels uh, in the surrounding area, all the way over to uh, Upan, this village right here on the German-Dutch border. And uh, that was the November 29th, 1989 sighting. But the sightings continue. Uh, quite often in UFO literature, in the UFO history, we find waves of activity where one day there are no UFOs being reported in a given area, and then suddenly a wave or an increase in sightings occur. It may be for days, weeks, months, or years. In this case, it went from uh, November 89 to the spring of 1991. And they literally have hundreds of cases on file, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I think it was interesting because General de Brouwer of the Belgian Air Force on July 11, 1991, held a press conference in which he not only discussed the validity of these sightings, the fact that there appears to be a genuine reality to it, but more importantly, they talked about the fact that two F-16 jet interceptors were dispatched after four separate ground-based radar tracking stations had locked onto an unknown target at the same time it was being viewed by the gendarmerie and other citizens on the ground. So uh, we had radar data in this case. It's not just simple hallucinations. It's not just simple eyewitness testimony taken at face value. And the radar confirmation was rather interesting. Uh, it, these objects were performing flight characteristics unlike any conventional aircraft then or today. Um, but what personally ushered me into the triangular UFO phenomenon was a case that was touched on by Michael Schrapp earlier, uh, namely the January 5th, 2000 Southern Illinois case. Uh, I just moved uh, to Rio Rancho two and a half years ago. Uh, prior to that time, I actually lived in the eastern side of St. Louis on the Illinois side of the river. And uh, this area is very familiar to me. But what essentially transpired, and I discussed this on a number of documentary shows over the years, you're probably familiar with it, we had a, uh, a large object, a, a UFO, moving at low altitude, coming in from the northeast over the village or town of Highland, Illinois. It then moved down towards Summerfield, which at this point it was observed by the Lebanon, Illinois police officer. Then it made this incredible acceleration and with the complete absence of a sonic boom, despite the fact it did go supersonic. Uh, the object was then sighted, sighted by a Shiloh police officer, who then saw it move off to the southwest. It was then seen by a Millstock police officer, and then seen later by a Dupo officer who said that he saw it increasing in altitude and returning to the northeast. That was the initial report. The sightings occurred between 4 a.m. and roughly 4.50 a.m. We were able to get the police dispatch recordings that corroborate this and help validate this sighting. One of the important notes uh, to mention, though, is the fact that Scott Air Force Base was within an estimated one to one and a half miles of this sighting. And as a result, the local St. Louis media thought perhaps this might be something military. To be quite honest, uh, when I go into a UFO investigation, I try to find the most practical explanation, as I think Greg alluded to earlier. And certainly my idea at the time was perhaps this was something military, given its uh, close proximity to Scott Air Force Base. However, taking a step back, remembering the cases and the reports, the eyewitness testimony of the gendarmerie in Belgium 10 years prior, as I'm sitting interviewing these police officers in the police department, sitting across from their desk, they're describing in exact detail what was described in Belgium by the gendarmerie. So I began to think to myself, perhaps there's a connection here, not only with the way that the objects appeared, but the way that they actually flew, the flight dynamics. So I thought that was rather interesting. So new insights into the case. Uh, I've been investigating this now for several years. Uh, additional eyewitness testimonies come forward. My friend and fellow researcher, Daryl Barker, in St. Louis has done extensive research in this as well. But we now believe, and I document in my book, The New Information, we now believe that as incredible as one UFO flying near a major military installation and being sighted by at least four to five police officers, we now believe there were actually two triangular UFOs and a rectangular UFO that was also sighted in the vicinity at the time. And again, all of this is in the book. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail, but I just want to illustrate that it was this case that I personally investigated that really brought the triangular UFO mystery to my front door. So again, the parallels that existed, and by the way, I, I've been having uh, ongoing communication with the uh, Belgian investigators. I just had a Skype conference with uh, Patrick Farron, who's in charge of the Sobets group in Belgium that did the investigations from 89 to 91. And he agreed with me that the shape of the object between Southern Illinois and Belgium were the same, the lighting characteristics were the same, complete absence of noise, Flight characteristics, namely the ability for these objects to hover, stationary, silent, with no downdraft, we're not talking helicopters here, 
uh, rapidly accelerate from a dead stop, turn abruptly, and make sharp, flat turns, as opposed to a conventional aircraft that banks when it turns. The other thing was the police officers, all neighboring police officers from neighboring municipalities that were in radio contact with, we, with each other. So we have credible witnesses, and I always like to emphasize, police officers are deemed credible. Otherwise, their testimony would not be admissible in a court of law. But they can convict any one of us of a crime if we were engaged in that, if they were to go to court and testify. Their testimony is no less valid just because they've cited an unconventional aerial object. So I think we need to take these officers at their word, especially when in the Belgian case we have radar confirmation to back it up. But what I found is going through the history, Belgium and Illinois had earlier reports of triangular UFOs. And this is where we get into the history. Uh, one case, it was a, uh, uh, another wave of sightings that occurred in Belgium, ironically enough, in and around Brussels and to the east of Brussels. This was in July 1972. I found this in Flying Saucer Review magazine, and ironically enough, it was also investigated by the same group, SOPEPS, in Belgium. And the majority re reported uh, three lights in a triangular pattern. Some actually described objects that were in the shape of a triangle. And again, the flight dynamics, the characteristics were shockingly similar. So we're looking at 2000 Southern Illinois, we're looking at Belgium, 1989 to 91. Now we're going back into 1972 and looking at sightings in Belgium. Well, in Illinois, I found this case from Winona, Illinois, 1979. And this was an individual solitary witness, but I think the title of the article here says it all, Low Flying Triangle in Illinois. Again, 1979. So there is a history of these sighting reports involving triangular <coughs> objects. But then I began to think, okay, I have all of this material at my disposal. If there are parallels between these cases, are there additional parallels? So this began my journey looking at the history of case files that we have. Some numbers to kind of put to this. Uh, National UFO Reporting Center statistics, UFO shapes reported as of November 2004. Uh, if you look down here, the largest number, no surprise, is the category of light, which I think all of us here will agree that's pretty ambiguous. Could that be a satellite? Could that be a star? Could that be a planet? But when we look at geometric shapes, in addition to that category of light, triangle over here on the very end, 2,782 reports. So that's second related to the 5,509 reports of lights. Now, contrast that to disc-shaped UFOs. 2,439. So uh, the saucers are starting to take a back seat, so to speak, to uh, what's being reported. We're now having these triangular UFOs with increasing prevalence. This was uh, in my early historical research back in November 2004. I was preparing a lecture for a conference I spoke at in Arkansas, and I was uh, surprised to see that the statistics still held true. So in February 2012, where are we looking at? And again, these are cumulative uh, totals. The category of light, 13,997 reports. Again, what is the next runner up? Triangular UFOs being reported, 6,957 compared to 5,288 of the classic flying disc reports. So we are seeing a shift. Most investigators know this. MUFON is aware of this as well. They're getting an influx of reports of these objects. But I think it's important to look at some statistics, put some numbers to it. So. Just like to share that, and a sign of the times. If you're not interested in numbers or statistics, just look at the books that have been released in the last few years. What happened to the classic ubiquitous flying disc that we often used to see on the 1950s, 60s uh, UFO books? Now they're being replaced by these triangular UFOs. These are just a couple examples in addition to my own book. Um, but the prevailing argument, a lot of people say, well, this triangular phenomenon is something new, therefore it must be something military. Well. I'd like to punch holes in the fact that these aren't new, and hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll agree with me. And it really makes you question the military explanation, and, and at least explaining all of these reports. Like Michael Schrepp alluded to earlier, I am fully convinced that some of these triangular UFOs could be black operations, could be black projects that Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, and other uh, defense contractors are working on. So I would say wrong <laughs> on that argument. Uh, but the history of reports, let me just share just a few, and again, what's in my book is a distillation of a multitude of reports of these triangular UFOs. Uh, here's one, New Saucer Twist, Flying Triangle Seen in State. This was from the 1960s. This is from the Hartford Corin. And you look at the description, you look at the lighting characteristics, this is very similar to what's being reported today. 
1955, this is California. It's, now it's flying triangles, strange, object, strange objects even La Crescenta skies. Uh, describes a large triangular UFO. Seeing is believing, Malibu Man describes triangular shaped UFO, 1978. We look on, 1960s, mystery flying triangle spotted flashing over north. Uh, this was from the UK. That triangle is no plane, says expert. And this is another one, this is actually from Cardiff, Wales. So, uh, describing a multitude of different objects. But look, the one question I get asked when I do interviews, whether it's on television or radio, how far do these reports go back? Or at least based on your research, how far have you been able to find these reports go back? One of the all-time classics, for any old-timers that are here that remember this book, it's one of the all-time classics in the field. The Flying Saucers Are Real by retired uh, Marine Major Donald Kehoe. And Donald Kehoe was a bulldog when it came to investigating UFOs, but more importantly, challenging the military and government establishment with regard to the cover-up. And Donald Kehoe, in his book from 1950, states, in one of his chapters, most accounts describe them as roughly triangular, about 100 feet on the base and 200 feet on the sides. And this was regarding sightings of UFOs in the Dutch East Indies in 1890. Now, what's interesting is not just the triangular shape, but the size estimate, 100 feet on the base, 200 feet on the sides. This matches the majority of reports, both in Belgium as well as the police officers from the Southern Illinois case. And yet we're talking 1890. Later in his book, he talks about a wave over England and Scotland in the year 1895, and he goes on to state, triangular shaped objects like those seen in the Dutch East Indies. So 1895 reports of large triangular UFOs. Well, really it comes down to this, and I think uh, Greg alluded to this, you know, do you believe in aliens or do you believe in military uh, projects? This was an article I did in 2003 uh, during my uh, investigation of the January 5th, 2000 case. And I love the title of the article, Is It Us or Is It Them? And I think that's really the $64,000 question. If these objects are real, where do they originate from? And uh, my argument is this, that uh, there's three sides to the triangle. I think there's three possible explanations. One, the most practical, United States military assets that they're test flying. The other, possibly extraterrestrial. I don't think we can rule that out as a possibility. And then realistically, we might be dealing with a combination of both. In other words, some of these are stamped made in USA, where other ones may be made somewhere else, off world. Um, explanations for these triangular UFOs. This really makes me laugh. You know, people say, well, these people that are seeing these large triangular UFOs are just seeing B-2 stealth bombers. Just a quick show of hands, who's seen the B-2 stealth bomber? Okay, we've, we've been to air shows, right, and so forth. These sound just like any conventional jet aircraft when they fly over. Yes, they're radar evasive, but they make a hell of a lot of noise. I've had one fly over me twice, and uh, it makes a lot of noise. And uh, the B-2s don't hover, they don't make the, the, these flight characteristics or maneuvers that we see with these large triangular UFOs. In addition to that, the Aurora Project is another one that's been alluded to that might be an explanation for these triangular UFOs. The TR-3A Black Manta is another black ops project. And then, of course, the TR-3B, which Michael Schrapp addressed earlier, so I don't really need to go there. So, and, and just uh, real quick, I, I'd just like to share this with you. This is just a quick clip. Just visually, I'd like to share this, just to show you. This is just a YouTube video. Oh, we do have sound. There we go. I don't know about you, but that does not appear to be a dark, silent, triangular object that's making a lot of noise. They're beautiful to look at, but I don't think that they can be mistaken for these large triangles that are seen to hover 500 feet over someone's head. So, just want to share that with you. Another size comparison, again, when we start looking at some of the reports, some of these reports actually say they're up to 300 feet in length, these triangular UFOs. We look at the uh, wingspan of the B-2, it's only 172 feet. You compare that to a 747. Uh, these objects are very large. In, in fact, uh, there was the famous case over Phoenix, Arizona in 1997. Estimates of that UFO, which was described as a V-shaped or triangular-shaped UFO, was estimated to be about a mile wide. And that's really one of the larger estimates that we've heard. Uh, one thing that you'll often see on the internet, I'll just share this real quick, we don't have to play the whole thing. We get these all the time. You go to YouTube, you type in UFO, triangular UFO, you get 
nice little videos like this. A lot of people, they send me links all the time. Hey, have you seen the latest video? I'm really not interested in video, especially this. This was from a, uh, a Fox News team uh, back in 2008 in Florida. And, uh, you know, this is interesting, but from an investigative standpoint, there's nothing in the foreground, there's nothing in the background, you've got the camera moving, and let's be honest, you have points of light. You can't discern a shape. Could this be a 300-foot triangular UFO over a cornfield? Possibly. Could it also be a model suspended over your bed in your bedroom with the lights turned off? Quite possible. So, internet videos in and of themselves really aren't good evidence. And, uh, again, of themselves, unless we have a multiple witness corroboration in that case. Physical evidence is absent with regard to these triangular UFOs. In all of the cases I've investigated, I don't have one account of these triangular UFOs landing or taking off, which is very interesting. Radar visual cases, which we're going to talk about as we go through some of these, they're compelling, but they're very few relative to the sighting reports that we have on file. And again, an individual case based on eyewitness testimony is insufficient. So we will take down an eyewitness account, but it's much more plausible, it's much more believable when we have 20 people that reported seeing the UFO from multiple locations that can corroborate each other's testimony versus one solitary individual. So in my estimation, multiple eyewitness testimony from varied sources worldwide that display consistent patterns of behavior uh, and have been reported over 60 plus years is our best evidence to support the existence of these objects. And again, as I said, individual reports are interesting, but mass sightings, and by mass I mean hundreds if not thousands of eyewitnesses observing these triangular UFOs have occurred. Real quick, let's just go through a few. This is one that I uncovered that had really never gained publicity before, and I was shocked when I discovered this. 1957. Their words, not mine, triangular spaceships over Denmark. And I found this article in Flying Saucer Review from 1958, and it describes the Danish Defense Intelligence Service investigating a wave of large triangular UFOs over Denmark. And it went on to state, it quotes the Danish, or the uh, Den, uh, newspaper BT in its April 16, 1958 edition, it states, Triangular spaceships have also now appeared in the southern part of Jutland. From every part come reports of, sorry, uh, of mysterious phenomenon in the sky towards the late evening. All witnesses state with certainty that conventional aircraft are not involved. It further notes, so many reports of a similar nature have been sent to the Air Force Station of Strykstrup that they have been unable to cope with them all, and more are expected in the near future. Well, I thought that was interesting, just to have a, a newspaper document that during the time. And again, triangular spaceships was the term they used, which I thought was interesting. Again, I try to corroborate as much information as I can. Going through my archives, I actually found a, a news article, a Reuters news article, dated April 19, 1958. It states, and this is again the title, Spaceship Over Denmark. It goes on to state that a woman reported seeing a dark, silent, triangular UFO over the village of Brohir. And she goes on to state that as the object was hovering, it was large and black and silent. And as it flew over, a number of horseshoe-shaped objects, each emitting a strong light, emerged from the larger craft. And what was interesting is the fact that Reuters News Service was able to find 20 other witnesses that corroborated the, the eyewitnesses' testimony. So that was very interesting. And uh, there's other cases that bear similar nature where objects are seen to go in or come out of these triangular UFOs. But I thought that was rather interesting. And this is just a, a quick copy of the uh, Reuters news article right there that kind of gives you an idea of where the sighting occurred in Denmark. So uh, 1958 Reuters News Service article, Triangular Spaceships Over Denmark. Then, uh, you would think that that would be strange to the uh, Danish Defense Intelligence Service, but actually five years prior, the largest naval exercise since the end of World War II occurred in the North Sea, known as Operation Main Brace. There were at least three to four documented UFO reports, one of which involved the Danish destroyer Willemos that was on maneuvers, and they described a large triangular UFO. And what's interesting is we actually were able to uh, obtain an old copy of the news teletype. And just real quick, it states that the first officer on the Danish destroyer Willemos has reported to Main Brace headquarters in Oslo that he observed a mysterious flying luminous triangle Sunday night cruising uh, while they were cruising north of Bornholm. 
And it goes on to state that we suddenly heard a whistling sound and saw a flying triangle pass at high speed. And it goes on to state, which is very interesting, the captain on board considered the report to be too substantial to be neglected and has reported it to Mainbrace headquarters in Copenhagen from where it has been passed to Sir Patrick Bryan's headquarters in Oslo. So a very early report from 1952, military mind you, uh, of a triangular UFO. Now, little side note to this. Uh, last October, I had Linus Merck from Denmark in my home, along with Dr. Eska Bielislev, who's one of the world's leading geneticists that was attending a conference in Santa Fe. They're actually filming a documentary series for Danish television, and they heard about my research. And given the fact that Dr. Bielislev was in Santa Fe, they decided to come down, and we did an interview for their show that'll be airing hopefully this fall or the beginning of next year in Denmark. And we focused on the triangular UFOs. The nice thing is Linus, when he heard about this Danish wave, agreed to do some research and some archival work uh, after he's done with his post-production work on his documentary. So hopefully he'll be able to find additional information from that time period from the newspaper archives and we'll get more information on this Danish wave of 1957. But uh, very interesting that that transpired. Well, meanwhile, back in Illinois, uh, back on the ranch, as they say, uh, in 1957, uh, the wave in Denmark started in November of 1957. The same week in Air Force Project Blue Book files, which is what we're looking at here, this is the cover sheet to the Blue Book report, there were two sightings, one in Woodstock, Illinois, and one in Delavan, Wisconsin. Same week as the Danish wave is starting to kick in high gear. One report in Woodstock, Illinois, describes a large triangular red object, green light in front, yellow or gray in the rear, low droning sound, traveling west to east and vice versa along the Illinois-Wisconsin border. At the same time, Blue Book also noted in Delavan, Illinois, one amber or orange triangular shaped object, 200 feet in size. Sounds like the Dutch East Indies case, doesn't it? Object was seen with red light and was in sight for five minutes. So at the time we have these sightings occurring in Denmark, we also have them occurring on the Wisconsin-Illinois border. If that's not interesting enough, as I continue to go through the Blue Book files, the same week, the first week in November, 1957, I found an air intelligence report from Indonesia, and it describes November 6, 1957, the sighting in central Sumatra by two fishermen that saw a large triangular UFO. They state, they went on to say that the shape of the strange object is a triangle and from each uh, angle white smoke was coming out, which is very unusual. This may have been a situation where one of these things was in some type of dis mechanical distress. The top and bottom parts of the object were prostrated disks. But again, Indonesia, Illinois, Wisconsin border, Denmark, all describing triangular UFOs. Now, 1975, Michael Schrapp touched on this, and he and I have discussed this case in uh, quite a bit of detail. Uh, Lumberton, North Carolina, this is one of those flaps or waves that occurred where for a period of a few days, we had sightings in a concentrated geographic area of triangular UFOs. These were all sketched by police officers that were the primary witnesses in these cases. Uh, Law and sight UFO in state, UFO sightings on increase, sighting of V-shaped UFO reported by regional lawmen. Uh, one interesting side note to this, and it's really interesting getting out, doing the conferences and the lecturing, uh, is the fact that this gentleman and I met in February of this past year at the International UFO Congress. If you don't recognize his face, if you follow UFOs on the internet, this is Mr. Lee Spiegel, who writes for the Huffington Post. Lee was one of the lead investigators. In fact, he and I spoke at the conference here, and he wrote up an article after our conversation on my research but Lee was actually sent down to Lumberton, North Carolina by Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was, of course, you know, had been the scientific consultant for Air Force Project Blue Book. And uh, Lee got a call from Dr. Hynek and said, I need an investigator to go down and look at these UFO reports that are going on in Lumberton. And Lee, as he described it, for anyone that's talked to Lee, he's got a great sense of humor. He goes, I was all excited. He, and using, he trying to do his New York accent. He's like, you know, I got Dr. J. Allen Heine calling me to go down and look at these UFO reports. I'm like, great, I'm going to see a flying saucer. And he said, Dr. Heine said, no, 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 no. They're not seeing flying saucers. They're seeing flying triangles. And Lee said, he goes, I was disappointed. He goes, I always wanted to see a flying saucer. They're seeing flying triangles. What's going on here? And so... Interestingly enough, though, this is one of those rare situations where he went down as an investigator, but while he was on location, looking at a site where they had had a previous UFO sighting by law enforcement, 
He was standing with four to five other law enforcement officers as they saw a triangular UFO come across the field, move directly over their squad car, and then if that isn't intimidating enough, shine a spotlight down on the ground and around them. So this is one of those rare situations where, you know, watch out what you wish for, you might get it. And, uh, but Lee described it in detail, I just did an interview with him, and uh, I was unaware of that. In, in the official writing, you don't hear or see about his sighting, but he's talked about it since then, and he and I have had multiple conversations, but he described it in detail. So obviously Lee was very interested in my research when it came to triangular UFOs. But it's very rare that you have a UFO investigator that now becomes a participant or an eyewitness. So, very interesting. Uh, I mentioned Bob Pratt earlier. He actually investigated this, uh, whereas Lumberton was over a period of about a week where they had sightings. On one particular evening, November 18th, 1980, there was a wave of sightings through north central Missouri and uh, eastern, uh, northeastern uh, Kansas. And reports stretched across both states in these areas here and I used to cover this area extensively, so I'm very familiar with the terrain. And they described at least one or two large triangular UFOs. These were reported by police officers again, by multiple citizens all across the state. And uh, it was over a four to five hour period. Well-documented reports. Uh, Bob Pratt, at, who at the time wrote for the National Enquirer, which I have his article right here, 100 Spot Gigantic UFOs It Cruises Over Two States. And I know what you're thinking, Dave, you're talking about Reuters and Associated Press, now you're talking about the National Enquirer. Where's your metric for, you know, good quality information? Uh, anybody that knew Bob Pratt, even though he worked for the National Enquirer, he wrote good, solid stories. For those that don't believe me, here are some actual mainstream newspapers that documented it from the time from my files. Uh, the Joplin Globe uh, newspaper from November 20th, 1980, and the Herald Whig from Quincy, Illinois, describing essentially the same thing. It says the public may see them, but the United States Air Force FAA just shrugged. Uh, one important fact is, in reference to the FAA, they actually did track an unknown target on radar that correlated with the eyewitness testimony. So this is one of those rare instances where we had radar confirmation of the UFO. And then in Hudson Valley, uh, in January, the Science Channel aired a series which I worked on, and we did a segment on the Hudson Valley incident. And this was a wave of sightings from 1983 to 1986 over counties in New York State as well as Connecticut. And this was literally seen, these triangular UFOs, and in some cases, boomerang or chevron-shaped UFOs, were being reported by hundreds of individuals, quite literally, if you can imagine, like Interstate 25. They had hundreds of people pulling over on a number of evenings and watching these UFOs literally drift over the interstate, uh, in particular the Taconic Parkway in upstate New York was a, an area where they had multiple sightings. But uh, this was well documented in research by Dr. J. Allen Hynek and Bob Pratt, who I mentioned earlier, that helped co-author the book Night Siege. Then of course that brings us back to the Belgian wave, 1989-91, as we move forward in our timeline. And again, this is Mr. Patrick Farron, who is the head of SOBEPS and who I've been sharing case material with uh, since my book was published. Um, and then, of course, the Phoenix Lights. Uh, for those that may recall, this was the front page of the um, uh, newspapers at the time and uh, describing this large V-shaped object that moved all the way across the state of Arizona uh, and many reports to that effect. And then, of course, the January 5th, 2000 case. One that uh, you may not recall hearing about occurred over Tinley Park, Illinois, which is just a suburb of the Chicago area. Again, as Norio mentioned in his introduction, I was the Illinois State Director for about eight years and uh, was in charge of all UFO investigations for the Mutual UFO Network at that time. And we had hundreds of eyewitnesses to this fact. I talk about this in my book. My friend and a fellow researcher who actually took over the state directorship, he's still the current state director in Illinois, Mr. Sam Moranto, did an outstanding job trying to document this. Uh, just one little side note, we have lots of witnesses obviously because this is a fairly congested area as you can appreciate in the suburbs of Chicago. But to add one more element, most of the eyewitnesses were actually leaving an Ozzy Osbourne rock concert when they saw these UFOs. There may be chemical agents that were involved, I can't say, but in point of fact, there were citizens that did not go to the Ozzy Osbourne concert that also reported the UFOs in addition to local law enforcement. So, but I'd just like to mention that because they were all leaving the Tweeter Center, which was the, the big uh, amphitheater at the time, 
and literally people were in, in standstill traffic watching this the large triangular UFO go overhead. So, and then previous research, I just want to touch on this briefly. This was an article from Flying Saucer Review 1959. This was the first serious article devoted to triangular UFOs, significance of the unidentified deltas. And that's often how they were described in the literature uh, from the UK at the time. And discussed some triangles being as large as 300 feet in length, very similar to the modern day re reports that we're receiving. And then there was a follow-up article uh, by the same author, Delta Valance, The Flying Deltas. Uh, and what's interesting about this article is it describes triangles or delta valances moving edge forward at times with the apex trailing. This is something, this is a characteristic that has been demonstrated repeatedly in the UFO literature as I've gone through these triangular UFO reports. It's one thing for us to envision a triangular aircraft, which is not a stretch of the imagination. If you look at the F-117A, the B-2, they have a rough triangular configuration. But have you ever seen one moving with the flat side as the leading edge and the apex trailing? It seems to defy conventional aerodynamic principles. In fact, in writing my book, I interviewed uh, a couple individuals from Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, and British Aerospace to get their take on it. And they were very perplexed, needless to say. Uh, Mr. Omar Fowler, I have to mention, it, he was actually one of the reasons I wrote my book. He wrote two small monographs focusing primarily on cases from England and not going back historically as far as I did with my research, but I have to pay credit, and he was very instrumental in providing case material for my book. Uh, none of us can do it alone. We have to work as a collaborative research body. None of us have any answers, but we're all trying to gather those answers. But in going through some of my case files, there were a few surprises that really stood out, and I'd just like to share a few of those with you. Uh, one of these involved the sighting in Dexter, Michigan. This was the famous wave of UFO sightings in 1966, where the term swamp gas was coined, uh, for those that are familiar with UFO history. And uh, this is actually one of the original front page newspapers I have in my collection, Jackson Citizen Patriot. Air Force calls UFOs marsh gas. Well, the next, it's interesting, in my collection I have a series of front page newspaper articles. So this was what ran one day, the next day, this was the article that ran on the front page. Oh, gas theory hot air, say UFO sighters. So, right back at you, Air Force. And that's Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was actually misquoted when he said that. Uh, in, in, in his defense, he was pointing to saying that these UFO sightings could be marsh gas, but what they didn't put into the article was the fact that he qualified it by stating, but I haven't had the chance to interview any witnesses yet. They literally bombarded him as he got off the air, off his air, uh, airplane in Michigan, and he hadn't even begun his investigation, and they're pressing him for answers. So in his defense, I mean, he really didn't have a chance. He said it could be marsh gas. Well, this gained so much notoriety that actually Walter Cronkite did a CBS documentary, UFOs, Friend, Foe, or Fantasy, which is an interesting historical piece when you look back on it that documents the 1966 wave. That being said, though, I was really surprised in going through some of my newspaper articles because I thought, based on everything that I had heard thus far, that these were essentially disc-shaped or football-shaped, cigar-shaped UFOs. Well, going through some of my newspaper archives, I came across this article, and it's uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it goes on to state in the article, sightings were reported three times within a week in the Ann Arbor area and the nearby town of Dexter, which was kind of the epicenter for these UFO sightings. But it went on to state, many made by police officers describing the objects as triangular in shape. So apparently they were seeing triangular UFOs in the same time period. So, so much for swamp gas. That's, that's my estimate on that whole situation. Um, but another famous incident in 1966, for those that are familiar with the history, 66 was one of those years where we had a massive increase in sightings nationwide. Uh, the Wanakee, uh, New Jersey River Reservoir. This was a famous photo purporting to be a flying saucer uh, beaming a light down in the Wanakee River Reservoir. But in going through some articles, I found this, and I thought this was rather interesting. It states, on October 30th, Dr. Harry Nielsen, a dentist from Darien, Connecticut, was driving past the Saugatuck Reservoir when he described uh, later uh, what was described as a large triangular globe bearing red and white lights. It seemed to be hovering at a low altitude over the reservoir. That same night, other witnesses on Long Island reported seeing a low-flying triangular object, and this is what's interesting, which emitted a shrieking sound. And that's one of those weird ones that just, it doesn't fit the pattern. The areas, and it goes on to state that the areas like this are similar to other areas that have had sightings. 
Then it states, in the fall of 1966, police officers, civil defense officials, and many others reported seeing brilliant flying lights and triangular objects over the Wanakee, New Jersey Reservoir on several occasions this fall. So, early reports from 1966. Then I found this one, and this was one I had never heard about before, and this really surprised a lot of researchers. A surprise witness that I had never known had reported a triangular UFO. Mr. Kenneth Arnold, the gentleman that uh, was misquoted uh, as uh, seeing flying saucers, he had, he had his sighting over Mount Rainier on June 24th, 1947. July 27th, 1966, he had a subsequent UFO sighting, and this one involved a triangular UFO. And uh, Arnold states, hundreds of residents of the city, as well as myself, observed what seemed to be an enormous triangular aircraft of some sort. Even though it appeared to be at a tremendous height, its shape and form was easily discernible. And he goes on to state that uh, officials stated, well, it might have been a balloon blowing in the wind, but Arnold stated, well, that's nice, but it was flying counter to the wind direction that day. So whatever it was, it was under some type of propulsion or control. But I found it very interesting that Mr. Kenneth Arnold can be tied to triangular UFOs. Well, one of the individuals that is probably one of the most skeptical individuals that would ever come forward with a report of seeing one of these is this gentleman right here. This is Dr. Harley Rutledge. He was the uh, professor of physics at Southeast Missouri State University. And he wrote a book called Project Identification. Uh, for those that have read my book, uh, my interest started in 1973 when I was five years old, mainly because there was a wave of sightings around Piedmont, Missouri. And this book is the only book that really chronicles those sightings. Dr. Harley Rutledge at the time heard about this because it was garnering a lot of local media in the St. Louis as well as Cape Girardeau, Missouri area where he resided. And uh, a lot of his colleagues were telling him, and he's, he stated this in subsequent interviews, you know, well, you're a physicist, why don't you go down there and explain what these people are seeing? And he said, UFOs? I wouldn't touch that subject with a 10-foot pole. And uh, later he decided because sightings continued, interest continued, the media, it was like a media feeding frenzy down there. Television news crews were going down, newspaper reporters were going down. Well, in June 2011, we actually had an anniversary commemorating the wave of sightings in Southeast Missouri. Picture of me here, the gentleman right here on the right is actually Mark Rutledge, who was the son, or is the son of Dr. Harley Rutledge. Dr. Rutledge had passed away several years earlier uh, with Alzheimer's, but uh, Mark was there to talk about his father's research. I considered myself read, well read on the case, but as you can appreciate, there's so much UFO information that we have a hard time keeping it all straight up here in our heads. I'm sitting in the front row like we have here, and Mark's standing up at the podium, and he starts re recounting the, the tales of UFO sightings in Southeast Missouri in 1973. Then he says, yeah, my dad saw a lot of unusual objects, he saw a lot of unusual lights, and then there was that large flying triangular wedge-shaped object that flew over his head. And I sat there and I'm just like, you know, what? So I'm actually holding a copy of his dad's book. So I'm sitting there and I'm flipping to it. And sure enough, I, I find on, uh, in the book, on chapter eight, entitled appropriately, A Terribly Strange Night, uh, Dr. Rutledge describes his own sighting of a huge wing or flying wedge. Just real quick, I just want to mention, they were actually on a municipal landing strip that had closed down for the night and they had their telescopes and photographic equipment set up trying to capture these UFOs. They had started breaking down the equipment, and he states that instinctively he felt like he just needed to look up. And he looked up, and directly above his head was this large triangular UFO. And he states in his book, the object may have been a flying wing, but one of extraordinary size and one that flew without sound. During public lectures I have given about UFOs, a few scientists have suggested that the craft may have been very low. And he goes on to state, well, you think you would have at least heard air rushing over it. But he goes on to state that this sighting of the flying wing was classified as an example of a class A, in parentheses, incredible sighting. This is coming from a conservative scientist, mind you. And he asks why? Because there was a low, heavy overcast, which places an upper limit on the altitude of the object, because there was a reasonable estimate of the angular width of the light configuration, because there was no sound, and because there were three witnesses for verification. And he goes on to state in his book, this must be called an incredible sighting. No other classification is reasonable. In this case, the observer need not have a PhD in physics to know that a very strange craft had passed overhead. And for those that are familiar with Dr. Rutledge, and I've talked to Mark on a number of occasions, his father was extremely conservative, so that's a very telling statement coming from a man of his background.
Well, in many of the collections that I've been able to gather from aging researchers and older UFO groups, this was a, some photos from the UFO study group of Greater St. Louis. And I know I have some old friends from the St. Louis area that actually attended some of those meetings back in the early 90s, mid 90s. And uh, these are some of the photos. They used to have picnics, they used to have radio shows, they used to have meetings at homes and at uh, different uh, auditoriums. And uh, they had a number of case files from the mid to late 60s. And this group was actually a precursor to the Mutual UFO Network, which is now the largest uh, uh, civilian UFO investigative group in the country. Uh, going through their files, I was amazed to find a lot of just generic material, but I found a number of case reports. This one I stumbled across, triangular UFO sighting from, from December 19th, 1967, and it was sighted right outside Scott Air Force Base, and this is a sketch of the triangular UFO. This UFO, which was documented in 1968, was literally filed away for decades. Then later in 2000, we have a sighting of the same object in the same location. What are the odds of that? And there's no way, nowadays people can come forward after they've heard about that case and say, yeah, I saw one back in 1950. But in this case, we had it documented in 68 and filed away. So we have it well established that this report was filed long before the famous 2000 case occurred. Well, in looking at the information, uh, obviously, you know, you have all of this information, you have this rich history, you see that there's these common denominators. The one thing that the UFO research community really hadn't done yet was create a working profile to find what these triangular UFOs are. So in my research, having reviewed hundreds of these reports going back to the 1800s, I decided to categorize or itemize all the characteristics that are commonly associated with these craft. I broke them down into primary and secondary, and very quickly, I'm just gonna check my time here to see how fast we can go through these. Uh, we're gonna just quickly go through them. Primary characteristics, beams of light emitted. Uh, this is a case from the UK 1978, UFO shot a beam of light at our car. One of the reasons I wanna go through these is to show you the characteristics, but just to show you the, the preponderance of newspaper articles that we have on file. This was from 1978, Stoke-on-Trent Evening Sentinel. But beams of light emitted usually fall into two categories. Laser-focused colored beams of light that can be seen traversing the sky or being shot down towards the ground. We also have spotlights, as I described, in the case uh, of Lee Spiegel in North Carolina, where it illuminated a large area, similar to like a police spotlight. Uh, so that's one characteristic. Three bright lights at each point. Michael Schrepp touched on this. This is the most common lighting configuration we see. This one's from June 17, 1978, Maplewood, New York. It's unidentified flies, but doesn't scare cops. Doesn't that make you feel real comfortable? At least the police aren't start running away from these things. So, and it describes that it had a white light at each point and red lights in the center. So again, this is 1978. Uh, large size, I think uh, we've touched on that. These estimates are two to 300 feet in length, uh, in size, and it tends to intimidate witnesses. I, I've actually interviewed witnesses that have cited these things decades ago, and watching them, you can see the apprehension, you can see them fidgeting, you can see them getting antsy, you hear the, the tremoring in their voice. Uh, this, these sightings are, as I like to define, unambiguous UFO reports. It's not a question of did I see something, especially when you have something that large over your head. But this was a case involving five law enforcement officers, uh, two different groups, by the way. One was on one end of Memphis, Tennessee, and one was on the other group, and they're in radio contact with each other, like the January 5th case. Interesting thing is in the newspaper article here, it states that, well, we were seeing this object, then suddenly this other uh, group gets on the phone from the other end of town and says, hey, do you guys see that triangular UFO? And they said up to that point, we didn't say it was triangular, so we knew that they were seeing what we had seen. So this was a sketch of the object, very large, low-flying, triangular UFO. Ability for these objects to hover, uh, that's a characteristic that goes back even to 1960, Santa Monica, California, and I love some of these headlines. Triangle spaceship is sighted, very reminiscent of the Belgian reports that we received, but in 1960, it describes a daytime sighting by a police officer of a large triangular UFO. And again, these are all mainstream newspapers. This was Associated Press that documented that. Ability to make flat turns. Again, these objects do not bank. They can be sitting stationary and literally make a flat pivot turn, which is very interesting. This was documented in the UFO evidence by NICAP, 1953, Cleveland, Ohio. And this uh, involved a uh, radio station manager that went up on the roof during a commercial break to have a smoke. And as
moving there that slowly made this black pivot turn and moved off and disappeared out of sight. That was 1953. Uh, then Silent Flight, the one that we talked about towards the beginning, the Westbrook, Connecticut, I just love this one because this looks so much like the modern day re reports we have today. New Saucer Twist, Flying Triangle, Seen in State, Hartford Current, 1960. And this actually is one of those newspaper articles that really all the characteristics we're talking about are almost in that article. They describe the silent object, they describe the low altitude flight, they describe the large size of the object, etc. So it's like when you start really gathering these reports together, you're, you're forced to conclude there is a reality to these objects. And then the question is, you know, what is that reality, as I believe Norio mentioned? Uh, Newcastle, California, slow speed. When these objects move, if they're not moving in uh, lightning speed, uh, you'll have reports, and this was the case in the Hudson Valley wave, where people said you could walk down the sidewalk and keep up with the object. That's how slow it was moving. It wasn't like conventional aircraft that have to have so much momentum and speed to generate lift. Uh, so this was actually one that was sighted in uh, Newcastle, California in 1978. Low altitude flight, this was a wave of sightings that occurred not only in the United States but in Canada along the U.S.-Canadian border. Interesting thing about this, this is one of those rare cases I mentioned earlier that the objects were tracked on radar and F-106 interceptors were dispatched, but the interceptors were now able to catch up with the UFOs. So uh, we have jet intercept attempt and radar lock line in this particular case from 1974. Another case involving radar, this one's very reminiscent of the Belgian wave with the Belgian Air Force, but this time we're looking at the Chilean Air Force. And this was from 1978 and May of 1979, two separate incidents involving the Chilean Air Force and they dispatched jet interceptors after they had ground-based radar confirmation of an unknown target. Captain Danilo Catalan Farias, which is pictured right here from one of the newspaper articles at the time, was able to visually sight the UFO as he closed on it, but the object continued to gain in speed and altitude to the point where they could not, uh, he could not catch up with the object, and he basically uh, aborted his pursuit of the UFOs. But another case, this one, 1954, I love these, these headlines, Six-hour dazzling glow, flying triangle hovers over cobalt. I mean, you know, you just can't make this stuff up. Uh, cobalt, Ontario, 1954. There was actually a wave of sightings, not only of triangular UFOs in this mining area, but other lights and unusual objects that were seen around that same time frame. And do we have time for secondary characteristics, Norio, or are we about ready to wrap up? Ready to wrap up, okay. That being said, um, I would just, if I may, just skip ahead of here real quick to the last slides. All this information is in my book in addition to a wealth of other case material. But uh, one final comment, uh, the Lumberton, North Carolina wave in 1975, they, they wrote a little op-ed piece and said that if people are gonna you know, concoct a UFO story, you think that they would shape it along preconceived lines, namely describing a flying saucer or flying disc. But in this case, people are describing flying triangles, which really makes you wonder. And it certainly makes me wonder. Uh, but in conclusion, the triangles are nothing new. The triangles have been ever present in the UFO data. Reports are consistent in their detailed narratives. Common characteristics exist. And this bolters the idea that we're dealing with a tangible reality, that these objects are in fact real. Uh, culmination of my research is my book, Triangular UFOs, an estimate of the situation. Uh, you know, for those like Greg, Greg and I were just discussing this last night, a lot of work and effort goes into writing a book. I had no idea until I actually tackled this for the first time. And uh, I'd just like to say that a lot of time and sacrifice goes into doing the research, writing the book. Um, I have a very special friend here in the audience today who has heard my research for the first time live. And uh, she's a very special friend of mine, her name's Veronica. And I would just like to say that she sacrificed a lot as well while I was writing this book. And I want to thank her personally while she's here today for giving me the patience to do the work that I wanted to do in getting this book written. And I want to thank her. I want to thank you for being here today. And thank you for your interest. And I hope to talk to all of you individually later on when we get together uh, once this concludes. Thank you very much.